This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of the Spirit and the Life of Today by Evelyn Underhill Chapter 2, Part B History and the Life of the Spirit On lower levels, and through the inspiration of lesser teachers, history shows us the phenomena of primitive Christianity repeated again and again, both within and without the Christian circle of ideas. Every religion looks for, and most have possessed, some revealer of the spirit, some prophet, Buddha, Mahdi, or Messiah. In all, the characteristic demonstrations of the human power of transcendence, a supernatural life which can be lived by us, have begun in one person, who has become a creative center, mediating new life to his fellow men, as were Buddha and Muhammad for the faiths which they founded. Such lives as those of St. Paul, St. Benedict, St. Francis, Fox, Wesley, Booth, are outstanding examples of the operation of this law. The parable of the leaven is in fact an exact description of the way in which the spiritual consciousness, the supernatural urge, is observed to spread in human society. It is characteristic of the regenerate type that he should, as it were, overflow his own boundaries and energize other souls, for the gift of a real and harmonized life pours out inevitably from those who possess it to other men. We notice that the great mystics recognize again and again such a fertilizing and creative power as a mark of the soul's full vitality. It is not the personal rapture of the spiritual marriage, but rather the divine facundity of one who is a parent of spiritual children, which seems to them of human transcendence, an evidence of a life truly lived on eternal levels in real union with God. In the fourth and last degree of love, the soul brings forth its children, says Richard of St. Victor, 53. The last perfection to supervene upon a thing, says Aquinas, is its becoming the cause of other things. 54. In a word, it is creative. And the spiritual life as we see it in history is thus creative, the cause of other things. History is full of examples of this law, that the man or woman of the spirit is fundamentally a life-giver, and all corporate achievement of the life of the Spirit flows from some great apostle or initiator, is the fruit of discipleship. Such corporate achievement is a form of group consciousness, brought into being through the power and attraction of a fully harmonized life, infecting others with its own sharp sense of divine reality. Poets and artists thus infect in a measure all those who yield to their influence. The active mystic, who is the poet of eternal life, does it in a supreme degree. Such a relation of master and disciples is conspicuous in every true spiritual revival, and is the link between the personal and corporate aspects of regeneration. We see it in the little flock that followed Christ, the little poor men who followed Francis, the friends of Fox, the army of General Booth. Not Christianity alone, but Hindu and Moslem history testify to this necessity. But Hindu who is drawn to the spiritual life must find a guru who can not only teach its laws, but also give its atmosphere, and must accept his discipline in a spirit of obedience. The Sufi neophyte is directed to place himself in the hands of his sheikh as a corpse in the hands of the washer. And all the great saints of Islam have been the inspiring centers of more or less organized groups. History teaches us, in fact, that God most often educates men through men. We most easily recognize spirit when it is perceived transfiguring human character, and most easily achieve it by means of sympathetic contagion. Though the new light may flash, as it seems, directly into the soul of the specially gifted or the inspired, 
this spontaneous outbreaking of novelty is comparatively rare and even here careful analysis will generally reveal the extent in which environment tradition teaching literary or oral have prepared the way for it there is no aptitude so great that it can afford to dispense with human experience and education even the noblest of the sons and daughters of god are also the sons and daughters of the race and are helped by those who go before them and as regards the generality not isolated effort but the love and sincerity of the true spiritual teacher and every man and woman of the spirit is such a teacher within his own sphere of influence the unselfconscious trust of the disciple are the means by which the secret a full life has been handed on one loving spirit in each the spiritual world was seen through a temperament and so mediated to the disciples who shared so far as they were able the master's special secret and attitude to life says st augustine sets another on fire and expressed in this phrase the law which governs the spiritual history of man this law finds notable expression in the phenomena of the religious order, a type of association found in more or less perfection in every great religion, which has not received the attention it deserves from students of psychology. If we study the lives of those who founded these orders, though such a foundation was not always intended by them, we notice one general characteristic. Each was an enthusiast, abounding in zest and hope, and became in his lifetime a fount of regeneration, a source of spiritual infection for those who came under his influence. In each the spiritual world was seen through a temperament, and so mediated to the disciples, who shared, so far as they were able, the Master's special secret and attitude to life. Thus, St. Benedict's sane and generous outlook is crystallized in the Benedictine rule, St. Francis's deep sense of the connection between poverty and freedom gave Franciscan regeneration its particular character. The heroisms of the early Jesuit missionaries reflected the strong, courageous temper of St. Ignatius. The rich contemplative life of Carmel is a direct inheritance from St. Teresa's mystical experience. The great orders in their purity were families, inheriting and reproducing the salient qualities of their patriarch, who gave, as a father to his children, life stamped with his own characteristics. Yet, sooner or later, after the withdrawal of its founder, the group appears to lose its spontaneous and enthusiastic character. Zest fails. Unless a fresh leader be forthcoming, it inevitably settles down again towards the general level of the herd. Thence it can only be roused by means of reforms or revivals, the arrival of new, vigorous leaders, and the formation of new enthusiastic groups. For the bulk of men as we know them cannot or will not make the costing effort needed for a first-hand participation in eternal life. They want a crowd compeller to lift them above themselves. Thus the history of Christianity is the history of successive spiritual group formations and their struggle to survive from the time when Jesus of Nazareth formed his little flock with the avowed aim of bringing in the kingdom of God, transmuting the mentality of the race, and so giving it more abundant life. Christians appeal to the continued teaching and compelling power of their master the influence and infection of his spirit and atmosphere as the greatest of the regenerative forces still at work within life, and this is undoubtedly true of those devout spirits able to maintain contact with the eternal world in prayer. The great speech of Serenaeus de Crecy in John Inglesland described once for all the highest type of Christian spirituality, 55. But in practice, this link and this influence are too subtle for the mass of men. They must constantly be re-experienced by ardent and consecrated souls, and by them be mediated to fresh groups, formed within or without the institutional frame. Thus, in the 13th century, St. Francis, and in the 14th the Friends of God, created a true spiritual society within the Church by restoring in themselves and their followers the lost consistency between Christian idea and Christian life. 
in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries fox and wesley possessed by the same essential vision broke away from the institution which was no longer supple enough to meet their needs and formed their fresh groups outside the old herd when such creative personalities appear and such groups are founded by them the phenomena of the spiritual life reappear in their full vigor and are disseminated a new vitality a fresh power of endurance is seen in all who are drawn within the group and share its mind this is what st paul seems to have meant when he reminded his converts that they had the mind of christ the primitive friars living under the influence of francis did practice the perfect poverty which is also perfect joy the assured calm and willing sufferings of the early christians were reproduced in the early quakers secure in their possession of the inner light we know very well the essential characters of this fresh mentality the power the enthusiasm the radiant joy the indifference to pain and hardship it confers but we can no more produce it from these raw materials than the chemist's crucible can produce life the whole experience of st francis is implied in the beatitudes the secret of elizabeth fry is a secret of st john the doctrine of general booth is fully stated by st paul but it was not by referring inquirers to the pages of the new testament that the first brought men fettered by things to experience the freedom of poverty the second faced and tamed three hundred newgate criminals who seemed at her first visit like wild beasts or the third created armies of the redeemed from the dregs of the london slums they did these things by direct personal contagion and they will be done among us again when the triumphant power of eternal spirit is again exhibited not in ideas but in human character i think then that history justifies us in regarding the full living of the spiritual life as implying at least these three characters first single-mindedness to mean only god second the full integration of the contemplative and active sides of existence lifted up harmonized and completely consecrated to those interests which the self recognizes as divine third the power of reproducing this life incorporating it in a group before we go on we will look at one concrete example which illustrates all these points this example is that of st benedict and the order which he founded for in the rounded completeness of his life and system we see what should be the normal life of the spirit and its result benedict was born in times not unlike our own when wars had shaken civilization the arts of peace were unsettled religion was at a low ebb as a young man he experienced an intense revulsion from the vicious futility of roman society fled into the hills and lived in a cave for three years alone with his thoughts of god it would be easy to regard him as an eccentric boy but he was adjusting himself to the real center of his life gradually others who longed for a more real existence joined him and he divided them into groups of twelve and settled them in small houses giving them a time-table by which to live which should make possible a full and balanced existence of body mind and soul thanks to those years of retreat and preparation he knew what he wanted and what he ought to do and they ushered in a long life of intense mental and spiritual activity his houses were schools which taught the service of god and the perfecting of the soul as the aims of life his rule in which genial human tolerance gentle courtesy and a profound understanding of men are not less marked than lofty spirituality is the classic statement of all that the christian spiritual life implies and should be fifty six what then is the character of the life which st benedict proposed as a remedy for the human failure and disharmony that he saw around him it was framed of course for a celibate community but it has many permanent features which are unaffected by this limitation it offers balanced opportunities of development to the body the mind and the spirit laying equal emphasis on hard work study and prayer it aims at a robust completeness not at the production of professional ascetics indeed its rule says little about physical austerities 
insists on sufficient food and rest, and countenances no extremes. According to Abbot Butler, St. Benedict's Day was divided into three and a half hours for public worship, four and a half for reading and meditation, six and a half for manual work, eight and a half for sleep, and one hour for meals. So that in spite of the time devoted to spiritual and mental interests, the primitive Benedictine did a good day's work and had a good night's rest at the end of it. The work might be anything that wanted doing so long as the hours of prayer were not infringed. Agriculture, scholarship, education, handicrafts, and art have all been done perfectly by St. Benedict's sons, working and willing in quiet love. This is what one of the greatest constructive minds of Christendom regarded as a reasonable way of life, a frame within which the loftiest human faculties could grow, and man's spirit achieve that harmony with God which is its goal. Moreover, this life was to be social. It was, in the beginning, just the busy, useful life of an Italian farm, lived in groups, in monastic families, under the rule and inspiration not of a master, but of an abbot, a father, who really was the spiritual parent of his monks, and sought to train them in the humility, obedience, self-denial, and gentle suppleness of character which are the authentic fruits of the spirit. This ideal, it seems to me, has something still to say to us, some reproof to administer to our hurried and muddled existence, our confusion of values, our failure to find time for reality. We shall find in it and its creator, if we look, all those marks of the regenerate life of the spirit which history has shown to us as normal, namely the transcendent aim, the balanced career of action and contemplation the creative power, and above all the principle of social solidarity and discipleship. We go on to ask history what it has to tell us on the second point, the process by which the individual normally develops this life of the spirit, the serial changes it demands, for plainly, to know this is of practical importance to us. The full inwardness of these changes will be considered when we come to the personal aspect of the spiritual life. Now we are only concerned to notice that history tends to establish the constant recurrence of a normal process, recognizable alike in great and small personalities, under the various labels which have been given to it, by which the self moves from its usually exclusive correspondence with a temporal order to those full correspondences with reality, that union with God, characteristic of the spiritual life. This life we must believe in some form and degree to be possible for all, but we study it best on heroic levels, for here its moments are best marked and its fullest records survive. The first moment of this process seems to be that man falls out of love with life as he has commonly lived it, and the world as he has known it. Dissatisfaction and disillusion possess him, the negative marks of his nascent intuition of another life for which he is intended, but which he has not yet found. We see this initial phase very well in St. Benedict, disguised by the meaningless life of Roman society. In St. Francis, abandoning his gay and successful social existence. In Richard Roll, turning suddenly from scholarship to a hermit's life. In the restless misery of St. Catherine of Genoa. In Fox, desperately seeking something that could speak to his condition and also in two outstanding examples from modern India, those of the Maharishi Devendranath Tagore and the Sadhu Sundar Singh. This dissatisfaction, sometimes associated with the negative vision or conviction of sin, sometimes with the positive longing for holiness and peace, is the mental preparation of conversion, which, though not a constant, is at least a characteristic feature of the beginning of the spiritual life as seen in history. We might indeed expect some crucial change of attitude, some inner crisis, to mark the beginning of a new life which is to aim only at God. Here, too, we find one motive of that movement of world abandonment which so commonly follows conversion, especially in heroic souls. Thus St. Paul hides himself in Arabia. St. Benedict retires for three years to the cave at Subiaco. St. Ignatius to Manresa. Gerard Groot, the brilliant and wealthy young Dutchman who founded the Brotherhood of the Common Life, 
began his new life by self-seclusion in a Carthusian cell. St. Catherine of Siena at first lived solitary in her own room. St. Francis, with dramatic completeness, abandoned his whole past, even the clothing that was part of it. Jacopona de Todi, the prosperous lawyer converted to Christ's poverty, resorted to the most grotesque devices to express his utter separation from the world. Others, it is true, have chosen quieter methods, and found in that which St. Catherine calls the cell of self-knowledge, the solitude they required, but some decisive break was imperative for all. History assures us that there is no easy sliding into the life of the spirit. A secondary cause of such world refusal is the first awakening of the contemplative powers, the intuition of eternity, hitherto dormant and felt as this stage to be, in its overwhelming reality and appeal, in conflict with the unreal world and unsublimated active life. This is the controlling idea of the hermit and recluse. It is well seen in St. Teresa, whom her biographers describe as torn for years between the interests of human intercourse and the imperative inner voice urging her to solitary self-discipline and prayer. So, we may say that in the beginning of the life of the Spirit, as history shows it to us, if disillusion marks the first moment, some measure of asceticism, of world refusal and painful self-schooling, is likely to mark the second moment. What we are watching is the complete reconstruction of personality, a personality that has generally grown into the wrong shape. This is likely to be a hard and painful business, and indeed history assures us that it is, and further that the spiritual life is never achieved by taking the line of least resistance and basking in the divine light. With world refusal, then, is the intimately connected stern moral conflict, often lasting for years, and having as its object the conquest of selfhood in all its insidious forms. Take one step out of yourself, say the Sufis, and you will arrive at God. 57. This one step is the most difficult act of life, yet urged by love, Man has taken it again and again. This phrase is so familiar to every reader of, of spiritual biography that I need not insist upon it. In the field of this body, says Kabir, a great war goes forward against passion, anger, pride, and greed. It is in the kingdom of truth, contentment, and purity that this battle is raging, and the sword that rings forth most loudly is the sword of his name. 58. Man, says Obama, must here be at war with himself if he wishes to be a heavenly citizen. Fighting must be the watchword, not with tongue and sword, but with mind and spirit, and not to give over. 59. The need of such a conflict shown to us in history is explained on human levels by psychology. On spiritual levels it is made plain to all whose hearts are touched by the love of God. By this way all must pass who achieve the life of the Spirit, subduing to its purposes their wayward wills, and sublimating in its power their conflicting animal impulses. This long effort brings, as its reward, a unification of character, an inflow of power. From it we see the mature man or woman of the Spirit emerge. In St. Catherine of Genoa, this conflict lasted for four years, after which the thought of sin ceased to rule her consciousness. 60. St. Teresa's intermittent struggles are said to have continued for thirty years. John Wesley, always deeply religious, did not attain the inner stability he calls assurance till he was thirty-five years old. Blake was for twenty years in mental conflict, shut off from the sources of his spiritual life. So slowly do great personalities come to their full stature and subdue their vigorous impulses to the one ruling idea. The ending of this conflict, the self's unification and establishment in the new life, commonly means a return more or less complete to that world from which the convert had retreated, taking up of the fully energized and fully consecrated human existence which must express itself in work no less than in prayer an exhibition too of the capacity for leadership which is the mark of the regenerate mind 
thus the first return of the buddhist saint is from the absolute world to the world of phenomena to save all sentient beings sixty one Thus St. Benedict's and St. Catherine of Siena's three solitary years are the preparation for their great and active life works. St. Catherine of Genoa, first a disappointed and world-weary woman, and then a penitent, emerges as a busy and devoted hospital matron, an inspired teacher of a group of disciples. St. Teresa's long interior struggles precede her vigorous career as founder and reformer, her creation of spiritual families, new centers of contemplative life. The vast activities of Fox and Wesley were the fruits first of inner conflict, then of assurance, the experience of God and of the self's relation to Him. And on the highest levels of the spiritual life, as history shows them to us, this experience and realization, first of profound harmony with eternity and its interests, next of a personal relation of love, last of an indwelling creative power, a givenness, an energizing grace, reaches that completeness to which has been given the name of union with God. The great man or woman of the Spirit who achieves this perfect development is, it is true, a special product, a genius, comparable with great creative personalities and other walks of life. But he neither invalidates the smaller talent nor the more general tendency in which his supreme gift takes its rise. Where he appears, that tendency is vigorously stimulated. Like other artists, he founds a school. The spiritual life flames up and spreads to those within his circle of influence. Through him, ordinary men, whose aptitude for God might have remained latent, obtain a fresh start, an impetus to growth. There is a sense in which he might say with the Johannine Christ, he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. For yielding to his magnetism, men really yield to the drawing of the Spirit itself. And when they do this, their lives are found to reproduce, though with less intensity, the life history of their leader. Therefore the main characters of that life history, that steady, undivided process of sublimation, are normal human characters. We, too, may heal the discords of our moral nature, learn to judge existence in the universal life, bring into consciousness our latent transcendental sense, and keep ourselves so spiritually supple that alike in times of stress and hours of prayer and silence we are aware of the mysterious and energizing contact of God. Psychology suggests to us that the great spiritual personalities revealed in history are but supreme instances of a searching self-adjustment and of a way of life always accessible to love and courage, which all men may, in some sense, undertake. Footnotes 42. Everard, Some Gospel Treasures Opened, page 555. 43. Canor Dolcor Canor, Roll, The Fire of Love, Book One. 44. Roll, The Mending of Life. 45. Benedetto Croce, Theory and History of Historiography, translated by Douglas Ainsley, page 25. 46. Dunn's Sermons, page 236. 47. B. H. Streeter in The Spirit, page 349. 48. Autobiography of Maharishi Devendranath Tagore. 49. R. A. Nicholson. Studies in Islamic Mysticism. 50. Baron von Hugel in the Hibbert Journal, July 1921. 51. Roycebrook, The Sparkling Stone. 52. Roycebrook, The Adornment of the Spiritual Marriage, Book 2. 53. R. of St. Victor, De Quator Gradibus Violante Charitatis. 54. Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 3. 55. J. E. Shorthouse, John Inglesland. 56. C. F. Delat, The Rule of St. Benedict, and C. Butler, Benedictine Monachism. 57. R. A. Nicholson, Studies in Islamic Mysticism. 58. 100 Poems of Kabir, page 44. 59. Roma, Six Theosophic Points, page 111. 60. C. F. von Hugel, 
The Mystical Element of Religion, Volume 1, Part 2. 61. McGovern, An Introduction to Mahayana Buddhism, page 175. End of Chapter 2, Part B.